You know, as the title is shared, we are looking at the Sabbath today. Um, and it's really important just to know right at the start, what does the Sabbath signify? It's very simple. The Sabbath signifies true rest with God. True rest with God. And apart from this true rest with God, you will feel empty, you'll feel lost, you will wander, you'll seek after other things, which is what the majority of the world does. They're seeking after money, after different idols, after riches, after fame, after different religions, all these things. But they're seeking all these things and they don't bring satisfaction. They don't bring that rest. And instead, because they're not finding it with God, they're left with more and more unrest. So I think the best way to think about this is think about a thirst that is never quenched. If you're really thirsty for something and there's no water, you kind of go crazy because <laughs> you're so desperate to fill that. Or if you have a hunger that is so great. And when I get hungry, I actually get angry at the same time. Hangry, they call it. <laughs> right? When you get so hungry and you cannot satisfy it, you kind of lose your emotions even. You go out of your mind because you're so desperate. Because you can't be satisfied. That is the state of mankind because they're separated from God. They're never truly satisfied. They don't have that true rest and that true peace. So by knowing this spiritual reality, when you look at the news now, you can tell why are there so many problems in society? Why are there so many people with mental problems? Why so many people with depression? Why so many people with anxiety, stress, and all these different mental disorders? Why are there so many shootings taking place? What is going on in this world? It's because people don't have true rest. They don't have true peace. They're not satisfied with anything this world offers them, whether it's through the internet, media, TV, gaming, drugs, none of these things. They don't satisfy. And the same thing goes with people with identity disorders. There are many people that have that these days, transgenders and all these issues that are arising from that. Why do they feel that way? Why are they so confused? Because they're incomplete. They're not complete because they're separated from God. So if you look at all these issues, especially the mental problems, true healing is found with God only. And it's all tied to the blessing that lies within the Sabbath. And so before we get into the main part of the message, it's important, let's look at the origin of the Sabbath. Where does this actually come from? And as with all good things, <laughs> the origin of the Sabbath lies with God. You go back to the beginning, Genesis 1. You look at creation. God is creating everything. He creates light. He creates the moon, the stars, the sun, the land, the waters, the seas, trees, flowers, birds, fish, animals, mankind. For six days, he works in creation. And on the seventh day, it says... God rested from all the work that he had done. God rested, and it says he blessed that day and made it holy. So that day of rest is a holy day set apart for our true rest. And that's important because it's actually built into our design in creation. We as mankind, as humankind, we are built with a need for rest. We desperately need this to survive. I mean, think about it. Why is it necessary that we sleep at night? You know, we're, we're awake for a period, but we actually sleep for a long time or large periods of our lives, right? That is because it is required. It is necessary for our bodies. That's that time where your body heals, restores itself. It's the only time your mind actually has a break and can release all the stress and everything and actually bring a little bit of peace to your physical body and your physical nature. It's the same thing that happens when you exercise. Why does everyone say you exercise and you build up muscle really hard one day and then you have to rest the next? Because
Because when you're building muscle, you're actually tearing those muscles. You're destroying your body. But then when you rest for a day, your body actually restores and repairs those muscles, actually making it even stronger. That is why as much as you work, you need that rest to balance it and actually to make you even better, stronger. So that is where we have it within nature, within creation, coming from God. But what about the law of the Sabbath? Because that's the real issue that this passage is about. Where does the origin of the law of the Sabbath come from? Well, it comes back to that time in Exodus. A lot of it comes back to that time, right? When the Israelites, they exit out of Egypt and they cross over the Red Sea. They're traveling with Moses and they come to Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. And there they meet with God and God gives them the law, the Ten Commandments. The law is good, it's holy, it's blessed. And the law is important because it is important as it is tied to how to keep a relationship with God and how to keep a relationship with others. That's what the law is all summed up within. It's having a right relationship with God and a right relationship with others. And in relation to God, it says to keep the Sabbath. To keep the Sabbath, it is a holy day of rest. And so this is where it comes into the law. So with that, we look at today's passage. And with today's passage, too, regarding what is going on here, you have to know the background to understand what this argument is really about. First, you have to know what the intent is of those questioning Jesus. What is the intent of the Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders? It says in verse 7 that they are seeking a reason to accuse him. So why are they watching him diligently? Why are they asking these questions? It's not because they're honestly looking for answers. <laughs> They are looking for a reason to arrest him, to accuse him. That's the first thing you have to understand. The second thing is tied to the law itself. By this time, the law of the Jews had become a monster. <laughs> what I mean by that is it had become an idol for the people to the point where it was pushing out God from their lives and they were replacing it with the law. And it's important to understand the reason for this. And we talked about this actually maybe a couple weeks ago or last week. Why has the law become so important to them? It's because of what happened in Babylon and before that. During the time in Babylon, they reflected upon themselves, why did God allow this punishment to come to us? Why did God destroy Jerusalem? Why did God destroy the temple? Why did God destroy us and take us into captivity? Why did this happen? And the conclusion they come to is because they didn't perfectly uphold the law. And because they weren't perfect regarding the law, this punishment came upon them. So what do they do? During this time, they have these factions that arise, the synagogues that arise, what is it all focused on? Keeping the law. But there's a problem with the law. It's not very precise <laughs> regarding its wording when it says certain things, like especially regarding the Sabbath. What does it actually mean to keep the Sabbath? There's gray areas, right, required. What is work? What is not work? So they have to start defining all this gray area regarding the law. And that's why they have the Talmud and all these other religious Jewish writings that came about. My point is, the Jewish religion before Babylon and after is very different. After that, and it goes with the Jews today, it became very law-centered and keeping the law. And all these gray areas are now defined. So what is considered work on the Sabbath? You know, what if you've got to cook? What do you have to make a fire? Is that considered work? What if you have to get, you know, tree branches and wood to build that fire? Are you allowed to carry the branches of wood? Is that considered a work? 
Now, how far are you able to travel on the Sabbath? Because traveling, that is hard. That's kind of work on your bodies, right? You're not actually resting. You're not sitting at home. You're actually traveling a distance. So during this time, they came up with things like, what is a Sabbath day's journey? And they define, you're allowed to walk this amount on the Sabbath. And it's defined in the Bible, it's a Sabbath day's journey. They have to define all these gray areas. And they define everything. And the Pharisees, they take this and they live for it. You know, Jesus even confronts them. You, know, you, you Pharisees, you tithe everything, even a tenth of your mint. And he's talking about even like the plants and the things they have. They're tithing every little thing to try to be perfectly righteous before God. So like I said, the law had become a monster. And so kind of with that, we see the real issue at hand. The first, it's a trap for Jesus. And the second, this question about the Sabbath, it's actually more tied to generally the law than anything else. What is lawful? And that's why Jesus even confronts them in verse 9. In verse 9 of today's passage, Jesus says to them, I asked you, which is lawful? So it's a question, what is really the law about? What is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save a life or destroy it? He's trying to question really what is the point of the law and specifically tied to the Sabbath. So the argument at this point, it's really between the intent of the law given by God the actual true meaning of the law versus what the law had become for the Jews and what they're arguing about. That is the issue. And this is an issue that I emphasize right now because it's an issue that's present in many churches today. This issue hasn't gone away. There's a lot of churches that are very law-centered. They're very legalistic. So we have to understand this. And what we're going to see through today's message is ultimately that Jesus... As he says, he is Lord of the Sabbath because he's Lord of the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. And that's what we're looking at in today's message. So let's look at the first point. And the first point is Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. We have to understand that. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Because keeping the Sabbath is an issue of legality. So first, Matthew 5, 17. And we're actually going to go through a lot of verses today. <laughs> but Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus is pointing to himself as the fulfillment of the law. Luke 24, 27, Jesus, after the resurrection, is speaking to some disciples that are walking with them, that are confused about all these events and what's going on. And so at the end, he shares something very important. In Luke 24, verse 27, it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets, which is basically our Old Testament, beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What does that mean? Jesus and the prophecies, the testimonies of Jesus are written all throughout the Old Testament. Why? Scripture all points to Jesus Christ. The law of Moses, the prophets, all pointing to Jesus as the fulfillment Another verse, Galatians 3.22. It says, The scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were prisoners to the law. Prisoners to the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. The law kept us prisoners until when? Faith in Christ. He is the fulfillment. 
And so regarding our righteousness that the Pharisees are always seeking after, and even many Christians seek after, righteousness is not by the law, but by faith. Scripture is cleared. Galatians 2.16. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law. Man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. It emphasizes again, by observing the law, no one will be justified. No one is justified by the law. A very important verse, Galatians 2.21. A lot of people know Galatians 2.20, and they don't read Galatians 2.21, but 2.21 is very important. What does it say? I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. It's very important. It's emphasizing the grace of God. Why? If righteousness, if you could be made perfect, if you could be justified, if you could stand rightly before God by the law, which is what many people try, they try to be perfect according to the law. He says, if we can attain that through the law, Christ died for nothing. What was the point of the cross? Why did Jesus have to come? Why did he have to die on the cross? Why did he have to suffer? There'd be no point to that, no reason for it. Just erase that from history. If we have the law, that's enough. It's saying that's not right because we cannot be justified by the law. We cannot be righteous by the law. That is why we are in need of God's grace. That is why Christ came, because we cannot attain it through the law. So it's only through faith in Christ and God's grace that you are made righteous, that you are declared righteous. Once again, Christ paid the price for our sin. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ died for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And this goes back to the point of the Sabbath. What is the point of the Sabbath? To be with God, to find rest with God. That is why Christ died, so an unrighteous person could be made righteous and you could be brought to be with God once again. So if that's true, what is the purpose of the law? Galatians 3.24 says, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ. That is the purpose of the law. It's all to point out that you are a sinner in need of a savior. And even regarding the Sabbath and the rest you seek in the Sabbath, it all points to our need for Christ. It's to lead us to Christ. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. And now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. We're no longer under the law. We're saved by faith. And so in today's passage, when they start arguing about the law and keeping the Sabbath, that is why Jesus replies in Luke 6, verse 5, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath because he is the fulfillment of it. The Sabbath isn't about, you know, this day or that day, oh, whether you keep it on Saturday or Sunday. That's not the issue. You know, if you meet with the Church of Mother God and those disciples in the street, they will emphasize that. Oh, you don't know the mystery. You're not, you're not truly saved because you don't keep the Sabbath. They will emphasize the law to you all the time. I've had many conversations with them. This is a mystery that you don't know. It's not about this day or that day. Why? The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. It doesn't matter if it's Saturday or Sunday. It doesn't matter. The reason we do it on Sunday is because that's the day he resurrected. It's the foundation of the early church. But the day doesn't matter because the Son of God, he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is the fulfillment because the Sabbath, it points to true rest with God. So if you have that true rest with God, that is celebrating the Sabbath. And that is found only in Christ. True peace, true satisfaction, true rest for your soul. 
So with Jesus as the fulfillment of the law, now we got to look at why don't I have that peace in my life? <laughs> I'm saved. I'm a Christian. Why am I lacking peace? Why do I have so much stress, anxiety? Why am I still lost? Because we have to do something important. The second point, set Christ as Lord. Set Christ as Lord. The reason we don't have true peace and true rest is because it comes down to who is your Lord? Who is master of your life? Is it you? Is it God? Is, this, is it this world that you're following after? Or are you really following after Christ? In 1 John 2.15, it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We have to avoid falling in love with this world and the things tied to it. Galatians 2.20, now we're reading that verse. <laughs> I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You have to put that old life tied to sin, Satan, this world, following that flow, put it to death. Recognize that has been crucified with Christ. That part of you no longer lives, but now Christ lives in you. Christ lives in you. So how do you live? You live in the body, but you actually live by faith. Faith in Christ. Another verse. What should we do? Romans 12.1. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Right? So what is this about? How should you live your life? To give God glory, to give God praise, to live for God's kingdom. This is your act of worship. What should we not do? Well, it continues on in verse 2, Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. But what do most of us do? <laughs> we conform to that pattern. Today's Sunday, you might be okay. But Monday, you go to school, you go to work, <laughs> you're going to start conforming to that pattern. We can't help it. Why? Everyone else around us is doing the same thing. You start talking to people. You start thinking about you know, your finances, your comforts, what possessions you have, what's popular on TV, what's popular, you know, dramas and all these things, right? You get caught in this flow and you don't even think about it, but you're just lost in it. Once again, you're following this pattern. And it's all about your pride, your control, materialism and comforts, making a name for yourself, your ambition, your success. It's competitive. And that's where all the problems follow because you're following that pattern. What should we do? Verse 2 continues. Don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? How do you come out of that pattern? Well, this is one of those ways. Through worship, through message, through the word, through prayer. Through spending time with God, your daily devotional. Those are times when the Holy Spirit works in you to change your thoughts, to change those imprints, to change those patterns. And kind of the, the culmination of what we're talking about is found in verse 1 Peter 3.15. First Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. That's what it's all about. The world's not your master. You're not the master. Satan's not your master. Christ is your master. He is Lord. Set that in your hearts. And what's interesting is what follows this. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, In your hearts, set Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And this is kind of interesting. 
you should be prepared to answer anyone that asks you why you believe what you believe. Always be prepared. Are you ready? <laughs> if someone asks you, you know, why do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Why are you Christian? You know, people that are, you know, are usually asked this will say, oh, because I believe, <laughs> because I have faith. They don't know how to answer because they don't think about it. They don't think about the experiences. They don't reflect upon their spiritual journey. They don't reflect on who Christ is and the work he did. They're not prepared. It says be prepared. Why? Because if you're prepared to answer, that means something very important. It means you're thinking about it to the point where Christ really is set as the Lord in your heart. All the time. Because he's the master of your life. He's what you're living for. So if he's really what you're living for, you'll always be ready to answer that. But is that true for us? Probably not. <laughs> Even for myself. You know, there are times when I get lost in the world too. You know, I'm human too. But we should try to do that. We should strive to do that. Be prepared. By being prepared for evangelism, by praying about your schedule, by being prepared through that worship in the morning, that is how you're studying Christ as Lord from the start. So I want to share just an example of this that I see in the New Testament of something, of someone who actually set Christ as Lord. And we covered this passage a while back, but it's in Matthew 8, verse 5 to 13. In Matthew 8, we see a centurion. So he is a Roman soldier. He is an elite Roman soldier and, of course, as you know, during this time, the Jews were occupied by Rome. So Israel was occupied by Rome. So compared to the Jews, a Roman centurion has a higher level. But in, Roman, in Matthew 8, 6, we see this centurion goes to Jesus because his servant is sick at home. And how does the centurion address Jesus? He comes to him and says, Lord, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in suffering. This is amazing <laughs> because he is addressing someone that he is on a lower social standing technically, but he addresses as Lord. Why? Because he recognizes Jesus, his power, who he is, at least to some degree, to the point where he actually addresses him Lord, which is dangerous because only Caesar is Lord, right? So he's actually going against his culture. He says, Lord, my servant is, a, is at home paralyzed and in suffering. And so Jesus is about to go to his home. But the centurion replies once again, Lord, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. This is how much faith he has. Jesus is Lord. Jesus can just say the word, and healing will come to his servant that is in a distant place. That is amazing. And that is why Jesus says that this person is amazing. He's astonished by these words of great faith, saying no one is like this. He's, he hasn't heard these words in all of Israel. Because Jesus is the Lord of that centurion. And he believes even the word has power. That's what we have to believe in. If Jesus is our Lord, and we've set him as our Lord, then we have to believe that his word does have power in our lives. Believe they have the power of healing. They have the power of restoration, of bringing peace. That he does answer our prayers that he does guide us by the Holy Spirit. We have to believe the word, the covenant, the promises. When this centurion saw those words, healing came to his servant at that moment. His faith was rewarded. And we see this again and again. Jesus, he heals by the word. Matthew 8, 16, right after this. Many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. He drove out spirits with the word and healed the sick. He's bringing peace to those people who are demon-possessed, who are suffering, 
rest for their souls. He brought peace through the word. And in today's passage, Luke 6.10, once again, healing. On the Sabbath, this man with the withered hand stretches out his hand, and he did so, and his hand was completely restored. Because Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. Because this rest that is found of being with God is necessary for our restoration. Once again, when does this happen? When Christ is set as Lord. The third point and final point today is, once again, Jesus gives us the true Sabbath. So he is Lord of the law, Lord of the Sabbath, and he gives us that. We see that. The Sabbath is rest, peace, restoration. It's found only with God, only with Emmanuel, God being with you. So in John 14, 27, when he speaks about the Holy Spirit being with you and in you, later he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. What is that peace coming in the form of when he's giving them peace? It's the peace that comes through the Holy Spirit. The peace of being made complete, restored, of being with God. He's saying, I leave that with you. I give that to you. Do not let your heart be troubled or afraid. In John 16, 33, he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. So where do we have peace? Where do we have rest? Where do we have a true Sabbath? In me. In me. He offers this invitation to all of us. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me all those weary and burdened and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. And that's what we need. Rest, not just for our bodies, not just for our minds, rest for your soul. We're not just physical beings, we are spiritual beings. Everyone is. They need rest rest for their souls, and they're not finding it in this world. That is why people are going crazy more and more. We need rest for our souls. It's an invitation to this. Revelations 3.20, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. We use this a lot of times for evangelism, but what is this actually about? Continuous fellowship with God. When you dine with someone, that is having a relationship. It is fellowship. Jesus is inviting us to have continuous fellowship with him. It's a call to enter into the true Sabbath that lies with Christ, to find true rest for your soul. So in conclusion, once again, today, you know, this passage that we looked at it is talking about the Sabbath. But in reality, it's more than just the Sabbath. It's about the law. What is God's intent for the law? Which as we went through, it is to point you to Christ and find fulfillment in Christ versus the monster that it had become for the Jews and what it is still for many Jews today and even many Christians and Catholics. Once again, Galatians 3.11 Clearly, no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law finds its fulfillment in Christ because he's Lord of the law. He's Lord of the Sabbath. And so in Christ, that is where you find that true rest. And so I just want to conclude finally with this. How do we actually apply this to our lives? We kind of went through this a little bit, setting the Lord, setting Christ as your Lord, right? We have to strive to do that. Galatians 2.20, be crucified. Don't live according to that pattern. Have that time of worship and prayer. Well, like I said, this isn't easy. You know, we get caught up in our daily routines, our daily lives. Um, it's easy to say, <laughs> but hard to experience. Hard to experience that true rest because we have stress, burdens, problems we face day after day. So I think the key thing is, Really, these two things, 
prayer and praise. At least that's what it is for me. Prayer, because Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, which is what we fall into, anxiety, regarding our worries, our fears, problems. Do not be anxious, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and God, and the God of peace, I'm sorry, I forgot the first <laughs> wait, wait. Do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the God of peace, the trans, huh? Oh, guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I don't know why I forgot that verse right now. Maybe it's an attack. <laughs> I've, I've said that verse so many times, I usually don't even have to look it up at all. But what is the point? We, whenever we have anxiety or stress, take it to prayer first. And trust to God, he's sovereign, he's in control, Why? We need that guard for our heart and our mind, our emotions and our thoughts, because Satan attacks those. So we got to put up that guard through prayer. We entrust that problem, that crisis, whatever it is to God. And that peace through the Holy Spirit starts to come. And what aids this is praise. Singing praise. That what works for me. And when I'm in my car, I'm stressed out, or you know, I'm just you know, driving even to church sometimes, I'm thinking about everything. And there's certain songs that I start listening to the lyrics, <laughs> and it just clicks for me. It's like, oh, what am I living for? What is this about? And there's one song I was listening to this, this week on the way to church on Wednesday, I think, and it was about the Holy Spirit and just God having a, a reverence for God, a healthy fear for God to the point where you're just praying that to enjoy him being in you and near you all the time. And that just is me. That's where true peace is found through enjoying that. And we see this even in the Old Testament. You know, Saul, he's afflicted mentally by this evil spirit. What does David do? He praises, and the evil spirit flees. In the New Testament, we see Paul and Silas in Acts 16. They're persecuted and beaten. They're thrown into prison. That is a prison. That is not a nice place. You know, you might feel like where you're at, your workplace or your school or your life might feel like a prison. <laughs> they were in this physical prison locked up. What did they do? They started singing hymns. They started praising God. Why? By doing that, they were transforming that prison into the kingdom of God. The evil spirits were fleeing. Angels were coming. And amazing works arose from that. Through the amazing power of praise in your life. And that's what I pray for you this week. That you will enjoy the Lord of the Sabbath and set Christ as your Lord. Let's pray at this time. Dear Father God, we thank you for this day and this opportunity to worship before you. We pray, Father God, that daily we could commit ourselves to you, not living any longer according to the pattern of this world, but allow us to live our lives seeking your kingdom and your righteousness first and foremost. We pray, Father God, that you bless us as we go out to shine this light of Christ and bring this peace and rest to those around us, always being prepared to give the gospel to those around us that are in need. We thank you, Father God, for this time, and we celebrate you as the Lord of the Sabbath. We thank you, and we pray this all in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.